Good evening, everyone, and a very warm welcome uh, to everyone this evening. It's a beautiful fall evening here in Minnesota. My name is Paul Voida. I am a faculty member in the Department of Theology, uh, but I am the director of the Institute for Catholicism and Citizenship, and we are the primary host of tonight's event. Uh, in a few minutes, I will uh, invite our president, Julie Sullivan, to formally introduce our speaker this evening. Uh, but before I do that, I want to say just a very brief bit about the Institute um, <clears throat> and what it does and where it came from and, and, and why it exists. <laughs> um, two years ago, actually, on this very stage, we had our inaugural lecture uh, of the Institute for Catholicism and Citizenship. Um, so we are, we are a new institute here at St. Thomas, and we are dedicated to, in a word, elevating the conversation, uh, elevating the conversation around the relationship between the church, between uh, Catholics, and citizenship, and, and the political realm, right? Uh, there's a lot of heat, there's a lot of noise, um, there's not enough light, and our task, our mission is to uh, shed more light than there is heat, uh, and to elevate the conversation around the many, many pressing issues that face us as citizens, as Catholics. We do so in the spirit of the Second Vatican Council, right, that called on the church and its members to engage less in a defensive uh, posture towards the modern world and more in a uh, open stance of, of dialogue, right, critical dialogue, but dialogue nonetheless. Uh, so our mission is to uh, elevate the conversation around critical issues that face us as citizens, as Catholics, and to do so precisely as a Catholic university, right? We here at the University of St. Thomas are in the privileged position of having at our disposal uh, the richness of the Catholic tradition, which extends back 2,000 years plus, um, and we seek to bring those resources to bear in the pursuit of elevating the conversation around the church and citizenship. So uh, we welcome you here tonight to extend the conversation yet further. Um, I would invite you to uh, learn more about the Institute by visiting our website. Uh, go to the St. Thomas homepage forward slash ICC and you'll get perhaps more information than you really want uh, about the Institute. Uh, please uh, check us out on usual social, social media uh, uh, sites as well um, for upcoming events. Um, so with that, what I'd like to do is uh, invite uh, President Sullivan to come say a word of, of introduction to our speaker tonight. And uh, let me say, by the way, uh, a word of thanks, uh, especially to President Sullivan, who uh, did uh, really the groundwork to bring the Institute into being. Um, I think it's fair to say that I wouldn't be here tonight uh, introducing, our, uh, introducing Dr. Sullivan, um, wouldn't be here representing the Institute if it wasn't for Dr. Sullivan and her efforts to bring this idea into fruition. So I thank her for her, uh, her work, her efforts, and her vision of uh, what St. Thomas uh, is and, and, and can be. Uh, I'd also like to thank um, Dr. Bernie Brady, the chair of the theology department. The Institute is uh, housed within the theology department. Uh, along with Dr. Brady, I'd like to thank uh, the dean of the, of the College of Arts and Sciences, uh, Dean Uhuru Williams. Um, and a, a final word of thanks uh, to the administrative assistant uh, of the theology department, uh, Ms. Lori Diamond, who has done uh, enormous amounts of work helping to coordinate uh, this event. If it um, wasn't for her, um, this probably wouldn't go off uh, nearly as smoothly as, uh, as it does. Um, just one final thing before I turn the mic over to uh, President Sullivan. Um, First, uh, after our speaker's uh, talk, uh, there is going to be an extended period of Q&A, so please don't rush away. Uh, there will be a lot of Q&A uh, 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 around uh, the, the talk this evening. I would also encourage you to um, stick around for a small reception in the lobby afterwards. If you didn't get a chance, if you don't get a chance to ask a question during the Q&A period, and would like to speak uh, to the ambassador one-on-one -on -one in the lobby, uh, I think you'll have that opportunity. So uh, with no further ado, I would like to introduce to you uh, our president, uh, Dr. Julie Sullivan.
Thank you, Paul, and thank you for your leadership of the Institute. We're very grateful. Uh, it is my pleasure to join Paul in welcoming um, Ken Hackett to our campus this evening to speak to us on the topic Between Popes and Presidents, American Diplomacy to the Holy See. Uh, we could not have asked for a more qualified or more illuminated, illuminating speaker than Ambassador Hackett, who has served with distinction in several high-profile positions around the world during his career. A native of Massachusetts, Ambassador Hackett graduated from Boston College in 1968. After serving in the Peace Corps in Ghana, he joined Catholic Relief Services in 1972 and spent the next four decades with the organization. He was the CRS Regional Director for Africa from 1978 to 1985, managing the response to the Ethiopian famine in the mid-1980s and later in Somalia and Asia. He became president of CRS in 1993 and held that position for 18 years. He then served as a U.S. ambassador to the Holy See from 2013 until earlier this year. Among other positions he has held, North American president of Caritas Internationalist, the Association of Humanitarian Agencies of the Catholic Church from 1995 to 2004, service on the Pontifical Council Cor Unum, which co coordinates the church's charitable work, membership on the board of the Millennium Challenge Corporation, a U.S. foreign agency, foreign aid agency dedicated to fighting global poverty, and membership on former President George W. Bush's Global Poverty Task Force. Among his many honors are the University of Notre Dame's Laetare Medal given to American Catholics for service to the church and to society, and an honorary Doctor of Laws degree from the University of St. Thomas, which we conferred upon him when he spoke at our undergraduate commencement ceremonies in 2011. The citation that accompanied the honorary degree that saluted Mr. Hackett for how he always based his efforts on the tradition of Catholic social teaching and the principles of human dignity and equality universal rights and responsibilities, promotion of the common good, and care for the poor. He once said that we must always remember the following, and I quote, we are one human family, and we cannot lose sight of this, no matter how dire the circumstances, or how massive the emergency, or how complicated the project. We embrace that kind of attitude at the University of St. Thomas and we embrace his belief system. And I look forward to hearing his remarks this evening. Please join me in a warm welcome for our friend and our honorable Ambassador Ken Hackett. Thank you very much, President Julie. Um, we go back a bit, actually, uh, Julie and I. She stole one of my vice presidents at Catholic Relief Services and dragged him out to, to San Diego. But uh, it was a, a special uh, theft and it accomplished some, some great things. And thank you, Paul. And it's great to be back here uh, and to see some old friends like Father Larry. Uh, Larry and I worked together um, when I was at Catholic Relief Services and he was at Charities and we worked together in Rome at, at Caritas. Um, so we, we have shared more than one glass of wine together in, in Rome, and uh, we're, we consider each other good friends. Let me start by saying that in a 1990 book, Joseph Nye of Harvard's John F. Kennedy School um, coined the term soft power. He elaborated further on this concept in his 2004 book, Soft Power, A Means to Success in World Politics. The Holy See has a century, centuries old engagement around the globe and has developed processes and procedures and programs to deal with the realities of world politics. It exerts its influence these days with neither armies nor economic power. 
it exerts soft power. As Joseph Nye writes, quote, when one country gets other countries to want what it wants, it might be called co-optive or soft power. In contrast, hard or commanding power of ordering others to do what it wants. And that's how the world, the Holy See plays out on the world stage. Now enter Pope Francis. He entered the world stage, really, as most people know him, in March of 2013. He was voted in on the conclave in the Vatican. And his engagement and his approach to international geopolitical world has been shaped by, I would say, his own biographical and cultural roots and his life and his training as a Jesuit and his work as a pastor in a big city, Buenos Aires. And what I hope to do this evening is to share my perspective on the diplomacy of Pope Francis and the diplomacy and international engagement of the Holy See and to give you a few examples of where we, and I still say we, though I'm retired from the U.S. government, we in the U.S. government and the Holy See found common cause. As ambassador to the Holy See, there are a few required functions. You have to do these because if you don't, you're not really doing your job. And ambassadors don't regularly meet with the Pope. It's not that we didn't meet with the Pope, but it's not one of those deals where he he says, come on over and watch the game and have a beer. That, that's not what you do. You meet with the people who advise the Holy Father. The main task is trying to figure him out. Understanding Pope Francis meant a detailed reading of who he was. What were his early experiences that may have shaped his actions or his inactions? What has he said or done that would signal kind of a directional tilt in where he's going. And second, you try to anticipate what directions he will take. And your job as ambassador is to inform Washington and other embassies around the world when he's about to engage on a specific issue or, or a particular matter. And third, and importantly, obviously, you try to influence his actions and the actions of the Holy See more generally. Well, coming to my position as ambassador to the Holy See in uh, the summer of 2013, thank you, Paul, uh, and coming as a former American ex-CEO of a large Catholic organization, the obvious first question you ask is, what's his strategic vision? That's a real business school kind of approach that any CEO brings, and it's expected that in that classical business school mentality, the chief executive will have a clearly thought out strategic vision. I found that his was clear and thought out. It was simply follow the gospel. Now that may sound a little bit simplistic or trite for somebody who is the head of a church with two billion followers. But that's what I concluded, and other people concluded as well. And so the next thing you ask, as the new ambassador trying to figure out the new pontiff, head of state, pope, is what are his specific plans? And indeed, I found he had many specific plans as he took over, and they were shaped by his gospel vision. He had plans about running the church, the management of the church, the planet as our home, the role of bishops and hierarchies, the accountability and management of money in the church, the terrible scourge of sexual abuse by clergy and others in the church, the role of women, where the church should put its focus. He wanted it to move to the peripheries. He wanted it to be a poor church for the poor. And he wanted a church that was merciful. And finally, my staff and I continually trying to find areas of mutual or potential agreement or benign coordination. And finally, where we had no agreement at all, 
but at least we understood each other's position. So that's the job that the ambassador carries out. And the Holy Father manifests his positions in a number of different ways. First is his teaching role, through his homilies, his remarks at Wednesday audiences, and some of you who have maybe spent a little time in Rome have gone to a Wednesday audience. It's something very spe uh, special. He defines what are his priorities and positions. He also uses public statements. He now has a Twitter account with 36 million followers. Now, I just read yesterday that our president has more followers than he does, 40 million. But the critique was most of President Trump's followers are bots. So I don't know. I, what do I know? Uh, <laughs> obviously, he telegraphs his positions about where he visits and who he meets with and what he says and, and also who opposes him. He convenes meetings on various topics and allows his curial staff to do so. The fact that he chose to convene the first synod on the family was major. It was not really a foreign policy issue at all. But what he did for the first time ever was allowed African, Asian, and non-European clergy to have a big say in what went on in those two senates. And of course, popes show their agenda profoundly in the encyclicals they write. That's mostly what the general public sees in the letters that they write. All of these are ways that popes convey their vision for all of mankind. And it is a vision for all of mankind, as well as the Catholic Church. It has to be understood and hopefully appreciated first by his immediate team. They gotta get the message. And then carried forward by the bishops and priests and people within the church. I read two recent articles by Jesuits, and that's not just because I went to Boston College High School and Boston College. Um, these were thought-provoking articles. One was by Antonio Spadaro, and the other by Jose Luis, Lu, uh, Luis Naravaja. And they were speaking of the international relations approach of Pope Francis. And I also found another history of Vatican diplomacy. And for those historians who are here, this is Leo Francis Stock's work of 1955, published by the American Catholic Historical Society. Society. It's a history of U.S. relations with the Popal, Papal States, which traces itself back to 1748. And that relationship was mostly commercial, U.S. and the Papal States. And it was more substantive 100 years later in 1848, where actually things went beyond just commercial relations. I had in my embassy a on the wall a facsimile of a letter from Abraham Lincoln to Pius IX saying this was in um, 1861 asking if he could appoint an envoy, Rufus King, to the Vatican. 1861, that was before the Civil War. And then there was also a picture in one of the rooms in my office of the USS Constitution, old Ironsides, which is moored in Boston Harbor these days. And the USS Constitution in 1849 was docked in Gaeta Harbor, just north of Naples. And Pope Pius IX was invited by the captain to come on board, which he did. And that was the first time the Pope ever stepped foot on U.S. territory. A U.S. ship is U.S. territory. The story goes that the captain was fired by his boss because the boss had sent a message, don't bring the Pope on board. But anyway, I don't know. I don't know. So we have a long history of dealing with the Holy See, even though formal relations with a real ambassador appointed were only opened in 1984 under the administration of Ronald Reagan. But let me return a little bit to the international relations and the diplomacy of the Francis pontificate. Antonio Spadaro, the Jesuit edit editor of the important monthly Civilita Cattolica, writes, quote, by rejecting 
rigid interpretive mechanisms and by showing a commitment for the common good, Pope Francis has put mercy at the center of his diplomacy, end quote. Spadaro outlines five traits of Francis's action on the international stage. He says, first, Francis practice, practices 360 degree dialogue with world leaders. He does not exclude a world leader with whom he disagrees. And I, show, I saw that very vividly with people like Joseph Kabila, the president of Congo. He didn't agree, the Pope didn't agree with Kabila at all and many other leaders like that. He, the Pope endeavors to remain open to all and he doesn't engage coalitions that often close doors. His hope would be to cope keep doors open and attempt to build bridges. Second, mercy leads and engenders reconciliation. So the concept of a holy war with Islam or some other group just doesn't fit his approach. He doesn't even think that way. Third, Spadaro writes, he believes that mercy compels us to witness the open wounds and compels, the Pope believes this, that it compels him to witness the open womb. Seeing and touching have a therapeutic value for Pope Francis. And how does that play out? When he visits Lampedusa in the first four months of his pontificate, when he goes to Yad Vashem, when he goes to Korea and South uh, Sri Lanka and Bangui and Armenia, or when he visits the U.S. Congress, which was hostile to him. He wants to be where the turmoil is and he wants to show mercy. Fourth, Spadaro writes that Francis knows that peace does not exist in nature, but must be pursued nonetheless. He sees his role as acting on behalf of the weakest and the most vulnerable. And fifth, he does not believe in shoring up the theologies of power that can be used to fight enemies. And we see that every day where people get these little cabals of this is my opinion and I'm going to stick to it and everybody else is wrong. He doesn't see it that way. He doesn't see religion as a dominant class guarantee of power. Rather the opposite. He sees Christianity as being in service to the world. Now Jose Luis Navarra, writing in the same Civilita Cattolica in the September issue, and you should read it. You probably have it in the library somewhere. He identifies four aspects of Pope Francis' engagement in the international arena. First he says, and he being a theologian, that the Pope speaks of the kergiomatic nature of his politics. And after I looked that up on Google, I realized they're gospel-based. Secondly, he said that Pope Francis' engagement in international politics is not window dressing, but inclusive and substantive. And here he alludes to the four principles that Pope Francis um, identified in his encyclical Evangelium Gaudium for bringing about, principles for bringing about the common good and a peaceful society. They were, first, time is greater than space. Ideas need time to unfold. Second, unity prevails over conflict. Third, realities are more important than ideas. And last, the whole is greater than the parts. Thirdly, Navarajo says, discernment involves time and processes. And some of you may know that discernment is a critical part of the Jesuit upbringing. And finally, charity, love, is a manifestation of a higher form of politics. That's kind of profound. And I, I must admit that I, I read this guy's article at least three times, and I can't claim to understand it completely. But since he happens to be the Pope's nephew, I figure he's got some kind of special insight into things, so I, I think it is important. But let's look at how those principles play out in reality. First, I want to describe a bit about 
how the Pope turns his vision into reality. I mentioned about the different ways he communicates his vision and plans. Structurally, the Secretariat of State is the office, what they call the curial office, responsible for relations among states and the general running of the church. The person Secretary of State, Cardinal Pietro Parolin, functions basically more like a prime minister than a foreign minister. And under Cardinal Parolin, there are two archbishops, two individuals who basically run the show. The substituto, that's Archbishop Giovanni Becciu, he cares for the internal matters of the church, the appointment of bishops, problems, opportunities, and things like that. And the second is Archbishop Paul Gallagher, the Secretary for Relations with States. He's basically the foreign minister. And he deals with exactly that, relations with states and relations with international bodies. Those three individuals, the Secretary of State and his two deputies, meet almost every day with the Pope. Almost every day, sometimes multiple times a day on various issues. Other heads of what are called the castries or offices have to ask for a meeting with the Pope. And so the Pope's secretary will schedule them, well, we think we can get you in a week and a half from now or something like that. But those three guys deal with the Pope regularly. And it's they who carry out the Pope's vision in a very, very direct way. Let's take a few examples of where the Pope and the President, President Obama, found common cause. I'll talk about climate change. I'll talk about Cuba, China, and migrants. So on the first, climate change, I actually never figured out what the genesis of this big climate letter that Pope Francis released, Laudato Si, was. I knew that Cardinal Turkson, you may hear that name around, I hope you get him here as a speaker sometime, actually was running the Office of Justice and Peace and he was dealing with some of these things. But other popes before Francis had also dealt with issues of ecology and the environment. And it was well known that when Archbishop Bergoglio was voted to become the Pope, he chose the name Francis. So me being a Jesuit product said, oh, he must be following Francis Xavier. Uh-uh. It was Francis of Assisi and the environment was important. So the Pope was oriented towards this issue. And I have to believe that the, uh, the idea of an encyclical may have come up in the first meeting that Cardinal Turkson had with the Pope. Cardinal Turkson, as head of the past, uh, Pontifical Council of Justice and Peace, was really wrestling, and I know this from my, my own meetings with him um, in 2012, 2011. He was wrestling with what he should focus on in his dicastery. And it's not without reason that he probably raised the issue of ecology, in his, as I said, in his first meeting with Pope Francis, because he was getting entreaties from oil and mining companies who wanted to know how they could get support from the Catholic Church for what they were doing around the world. He was also getting entreaties from environmental groups who wanted to see something substantive happen. And lastly, he was getting in treaties from groups that didn't agree with climate change. So with all that kind of conflict and dialectic going on, he probably raised the issue with the Pope. A letter would do the job. But secondly, there was another important item. In November of 2015, there was to be the Paris climate change meeting, a very important meeting. And that date figured significantly on the papal calendar. They wanted to make a difference. They wanted to make, have it as a marker, and they wanted to hit that marker. So the process of drafting the actual document began in 2013 and evolved throughout 14. Um, by 2015, 
The encyclical Laudato Si was hatched, January 2015. That's when the world began to know that the Vatican is put, going to put out an encyclical on the environment, on ecology, on climate. And all of a sudden, there was a wake-up. And I had, as ambassador, a rush of people coming in to try to tell the Vatican what they should put in the encyclical. Because finally they realized, uh-oh, this is going to have some gravitas. In fact, uh, early in 2015, there's a road that goes, you see it in pictures, it leads directly into St. Peter's Square. It's called Via Conciliazione. And you march down it, people stand on it during the Mass and Sunday, and it, it's a main road, and there's a bunch of hotels on it. I recall one time, one of the anti-climate change groups, whose name I will not mention, held a big rally on conciliazione, throwing around a lot of money, at the very same time that inside Vatican City, there was a meeting at the Pontifical Academy of Sciences on climate change. They wanted to see if they could influence it to stop the Vatican from producing a letter on climate change. One of, just as an aside, one of the most interesting visits I had in conjunction with the drafting of the encyclical was um, from the EPA administrator, Gina McCarthy. Uh, first, it was nice having a visit from somebody from my hometown. She really spoke in proper Bostonese. And second, the tour that the Vatican put on for her, now she's the EPA administrator, and some of you may know who the administrator is now and what he's doing. First of all, the Vatican took us down to look at their boilers. I mean, this is really checking out the bottom of the thing. And what they wanted to show us is that there were these giant boilers, almost as big as this section of the room, that were 150 years old. And next to them, there were boilers about two times the side of the podium. And to show that the new boilers were so much more efficient than the old boilers, and they were making and taking steps to increase their energy efficiency. And next they took us to overlook the solar panels on the top of Paul VI meeting hall. Lots of them. Lots yeah. of them. And then finally they took us up to the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel where they had just installed new energy efficient air conditioning, air cleaning, um, and a new lighting system which were all uh, more efficient. So the Vatican was wanting to show the EPA administrator, we're making personal progress here. Later, when uh, Gina met with Cardinal Turkson, she came away with a clear sense that between the Holy See and the Obama administration, they were on the exact same page for the climate uh, meeting in Paris. La Dato Si was released, and it really carried a big influence on the world stage. To those people who were hesitant um, and who were looking for support, that's where the Pope used his stature. Let me go to Cuba. Again, I don't know the exact construction or genesis of the Cuba deal. From the Obama administration's point of view, during the campaign, during the first campaign, 2007, 2008, President Obama, or candidate Obama, had said something to the effect that the Cuban embargo has been around since I was in high school, and it's not getting us any place. We've got to find a way to change it. So the Obama administration was oriented towards a change. So then you can imagine Pope Francis, who had visited Cuba on a number of occasions and actually had written a piece about the church in Cuba, comes to office and as a new positive, uh, he convenes his senior staff basically to outline his priorities. This is what I'm imagining. I don't know this for sure. And it just so happens that two of the senior individuals in the Secretary of State, another cardinal 
who he was soon to place as the head of the Office of Clergy, the cardinal head of the Latin American section, and at least four cardinals in his advisory council of nine had a lot of experience in Cuba. So when the new pope, the new chief executive officer, outlines his strategies, you know, sometimes everybody's sitting in the room and he says something and everybody looks down at their shoes. because They don't want to go along with this new idea. It's very normal in, in a corporate or, or any other organizational setting. But now he outlines a strategy. He says, I would like to do something about the U.S.-Cuba relations. And I can only imagine there must have been some fist pumps and, yo, let's go for it. And it met with tremendous applause. Mercy leads and engenders reconciliation. Cuba is a practical example of that observation. Then when President Obama came in March uh, 2014, the meeting between President Obama and the Pope lasted for just about an hour. It was the longest meeting Pope Francis had with any head of state. And I have to believe, and the White House just wouldn't plain tell me, that most of that meeting was where they hatched the plan for what they're going to do between the Vatican's role, the U.S.'s role, and Cuba's role in some kind of reconciliation. The Pope didn't agree with Castro's policies, nor did he agree with the longstanding U.S. position but he took that 360-degree dialogue approach. He talked to everybody if it meant reconciliation. Third, as uh, Narav have a uh, writes of Francis's perspective, unity prevails over conflict. Realities are more important than ideas. The U.S. and Cuba were both stuck by each other's ideological positions. The role of the Vatican was to insert reality between the two ideologies. While things recently have gone through a setback, nonetheless, the significance of the Vatican's involvement in, and future detente between US and Cuba is a potential uh, reality. Another example I'd like to offer of the Pope's diplomacy or Vatican's engagement on the international scene is China. The Vatican has been in a virtual stalemate with China for 70 years. There are many issues of disagreement and discord. But Pope Francis said early on in his pontificate that he wanted to visit. He hoped that there could be some improvement in relationship between the Holy See and China. Then, looking for that opportunity, in March of 2014, two friends of his from Argentina stopped at the Vatican to meet with him on their way to China. So what's he do? He decides to write a note, a handwritten note, to President Xi Jinping, congratulating him on his election and expressing the Pope's hope for better relations. The Pope then reiterated his desire for better relations when he met with the Asian bishops in August of that year. Now, some dialogue between the Vatican and China have been going on for years, but it wasn't really getting anywhere. And I can only say that in 2016, I saw openings slowly happening. The Chinese sent the first high-level delegation to a meeting in the Vatican, the first in 70 years. So little by little, things were, were, were moving. And as Spadaro recounts, peace does not exist in nature, but it's got to be pursued. And Francis pursues peace. He pursues not only peace, but human rights and religious freedoms and so many other issues. While the Pope may want to open relations with the Chinese government, there's no conflict in that effort with U.S. policy towards China. U.S. also wants freedoms of religious practice and expression. 
the Pope really understands his stature on the world stage now four years into his pontificate. He knows that what he says influences situations and people. Let me finally go to the issue of migrants. The Obama administration sought to increase the number of immigrant emissions in the second term from 70,000 to 100,000. But President Obama's concern was totally outmatched by Pope Francis's concern. Possibly the most persistent agenda on his world stage has been his concern for migrants. This appears to come directly from his heart, his desire to show and manifest God's mercy to the most marginalized. And he believes that those people on those boats coming across the Mediterranean are the most marginalized. And he feels they should be helped. His desire to show and manifest God's mercy is incredible. His early visit to Lampedusa that I mentioned earlier, his visit to Lesbos in Greece, his call for all parishes to take in refugees, his example of personally bringing 12 families with him from Lesbos back to Rome and putting one family in my parish, another family in the parish inside Vatican City, right near Santa Ana Gate, is reflective of he's ready to put action behind his concern. He manifests mercy. He moves to the peripheries. He sees that charity is a higher form of politics. And he shows Christianity as those in service to the world, sometimes walking an uncomfortable walk. That uncomfortable walk can be in Europe or it can be in our own country. But the walk he does. He does the talk and he does the walk. And as ambassador from the US to the Holy See, I was privileged to watch all of that engagement unfold. With the visit of President Obama and two visits of Vice President Biden, three visits of Secretary Kerry and multiple others from the administration, I left relations between the Holy See and the Obama administration as fruitful and active. And hopefully my successor will be able to continue those strong relations between the US government and the Holy See. So thank you, Tommies, for having me back here again. Thank you for listening and not falling asleep. And I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much. <laughs> Paul, how should we do this? nuclear deterrent um, to the tune of, I believe, $130 billion. I forget what the price tag was. Uh, um, uh, I, um, I can imagine myself all kinds of objections to this. What is the Vatican's response to this? And was, um, was one ever made public or is it not appropriate? What, what, is, what is your perception from your, the perspective that you enjoyed uh, as our ambassador? I, I dealt with nuclear nonproliferation issues. Um, I claim no specific expertise. I always brought somebody who knew much more than myself. And I brought one uh, woman scientist in to explain to the Vatican what this modernization was. And now you're about my age, so you can understand this. She said, we still have vacuum tubes in some of the computers that run our, com our uh, missiles. Vacuum tubes. Those are those light bulb things that were in the old televisions. We haven't changed them. Uh, now, there, there might be a, a good reason you can't hack those computers. I, I don't know. But she said, we have to modernize. We're going to have fewer but they're going to be more functional until everybody draws down their nuclear arsenals. 
Secondly, more recently, like within the last month, there have been some statements made by the Vatican at the uh, United Nations calling for um, a more aggressive posture to uh, nuclear nonproliferation and denuclearization. The Vatican doesn't want to make, from what I understood from them, the blatant statement, nobody should have nuclear weapons, because then Pakistan, North Korea, China will have them, and the US will get rid of them, and, and Russia will hide them. Uh, they know that. So it's got to be done in a sensible, logical, determined way. But I believe it will be done. Now, that's a lot of hope on my part, because I'm not sure under this administration anything's going to change. Yes, sir. and their desire to build uh, a little more dialogue and substantive um, uh, relations between Palestine and Israel during these turns, as there were some real, real flare-up difficulties between those two states in that region. Um, also, Pope Francis's visit to Yad Vashem shows um, a concern about that region as well. Is there any way in that the, U the Vatican or the U.S. and Vatican kind of had a, had a hand in being able to foster some sort of um, attempts at building a relationship between those two states during that period? I can say that one of the primary agendas of John Kerry as Secretary of State was to bring about a peaceful solution, a peaceful two-state solution. He was not able to accomplish it. The Vatican supported him fully. He, as I said, he came and visited in the Vatican uh, at least three times. And in each one of those times, part of the lengthy conversation he had in the Secretary of State was about the Israel-Palestine uh, question. Where it stands today, I am not very hopeful. Um, there's no pullback on the settlements. There doesn't seem to be any agreement from the Netanyahu government. There is a glimmer of hope in this new individual who's dealing with Hamas. Uh, but I, I would lay no money that we're going to see in the next three years any uh, improvement there. The Vatican like, would like to see it because they're, they pursue peace uh, and they will pursue any opportunity there as well. Thank you. If the current administration would have asked you to be an ambassador for this term, would you have accepted that? No. <laughs> I, I could not defend some of these policies. Some I could, but uh, you're expected as ambassador to defend the policies of the, of the president, uh, and some I couldn't. I think anybody is going to have a problem defending why we're pulling out of the climate agreement, why we may be pulling back on the Iran agreement, um, the migration questions and how they're being handled. Anyway, I couldn't do it. I don't have that um, ability. Did you ever experience any tensions between your uh, loyalty as a Catholic and your responsibility as U.S. Ambassador? No. I, I would give you a general answer, no. Um, we were not required and were not engaged in the domestic contentious issues on health care, abortion, birth control, things like that. That just wasn't in my portfolio. My portfolio was foreign policy. So on the foreign policy side, there were tensions. Certainly, the, the Holy See wanted to know very early in the game what our objectives were in Syria. And uh, there were tense times when I couldn't explain fully what they were, so I brought in a general to explain what they were. Um, there were other tensions that we had, but not because of my Catholic faith. We ran into roadblocks on agreements that we were trying to um, enter into with the Vatican on taxation. 
but that had nothing to do with uh, my faith as a Catholic. Um, a question I'd like to ask. I have my class here, and we've been studying Pope Francis, and we've been reading from Laudato Si. And you mentioned early in your lecture that you had to really try to kind of understand where he was coming from and how his early experiences influenced him. Could you share some of your insights on that with us? Well, first of all, uh, he was he was a 39-year-old Jesuit provincial, the guy who was in charge of the Jesuits, in Argentina during the Dirty War. Now, if you don't know what the Dirty War is, go and Google it. It was pretty bad. Thousands and thousands of people were disappeared. And he, as the provincial of the Jesuits, had young Jesuits working in the barrio with the people who were being disappeared. And there was conflict. Because within the community, some of the older Jesuits said, oh, you should be supporting the government more and not these communists. And they're... So he had to struggle with that. And at the end of his six-year term, basically, he was asked, go to Germany, get out of the way. So he was exiled for a while. And when he came back to Argentina, he was sent to a place called Cordoba, which is out there. And he was to spend the rest of his life as a parish priest out there. So that's one element. The second element is when he eventually became the Archbishop of Buenos Aires with that background of knowing who the bad guys were. He had to deal with them. As a big city Archbishop, you've got all kinds of scoundrels coming around you with money deals. You know, oh, your excellency, I have a deal for you. Just a million dollars and I, you know, I will deposit half a million in your bank on Thursday and then we'll see about the rest. You know, uh, there were all kinds of deals. So I found that Francis's default was stay away from the money because of those kind of experiences. He also knew who was pulling the wool over his eyes. Th those were two elements. Um, and thirdly, I think his experience in Latin America as uh, one of the documents that is defining of his kind of strategic vision and plan is from the meeting in Aparacida in uh, 2007. If you read that big, thick document, you say, that's what Francis is doing. It, it's amazing. And then lastly, he was treated pretty badly at times by various high-level people in the Vatican. And that shaped, in some ways, his view of the curia and also of clericalism and the role of bishops. I mean, they stepped on him at certain times when he was archbishop. They wouldn't let him do things. And he's saying, they don't know anything. And here I am having to deal with the reality. So all that has shaped a little bit about who he is and how he acts and how he doesn't act. Uh, a good book, if you want to uh, read it, there's two good books. Um, one is by Elizabeth Piquet, who knew him personally in uh, Argentina for a long time. Um, she's the uh, spouse of Jerry O'Connell, who writes for America Magazine. She's an Argentinian. That, that's pretty good. And then the second one is by Austin Iverly, um, The Francis Revolution, which, which goes into a lot of detail about his, his background. There are many others uh, that get little pieces of it. But I, I found, unless I understood a little bit about who he was. I couldn't figure out who he was going to be. We've seen some of his priorities, obviously, for the last several years. What you're looking forward, where do you see the Pope's priorities? Let's see the next two, three years. The whole, um, I guess I call it a concept, but it's not really a, uh, the, the thought of mercy permeates everything. And I'll give you an example of how I think he thinks about it. So he holds the first synod on the family, a very contentious synod. 
It dealt with annulments, divorce, polygamy, all kinds of rough issues about family. And he gets a lot of pushback from various communities of bishops around the world and other people. He holds the second synod, part of the synod on the family, in 2015 and concludes it about early December. Just about the time of concluding the synod, he announces the year of mercy for 2016. He hasn't even released the final product on the synod yet, which he knows is going to be controversial and is all about mercy. And so he has the year of mercy at the time he releases the synodal report that calls for mercy. I think the guy's thinking. Uh, I, I think that's one element, and that will pervade. Uh, the migrant issue, as I said, he's not going to give up on. Um, there was some talk before I left that he may release an encyclical on economics, and there have been many others, of course. Um, but this would have his own stamp on it and where he would take it. When he released uh, Evangelium Gaudium and Laudato Si, there was controversy that he's too socialist, that he's, he's too Latin, all those kind of things, which when I reread those encyclicals, I said, no, other popes have said the exact same thing. So he could put something out on the, on the economy. Um, he's pushing on the clericalism issue. Um, that just bothers him. And so he wants to see dust on the, the sandals. Uh, and he wants you coming back as a priest smelling like the sheep. Uh, and then he's going to continue to appoint um, cardinals who are out there. Not necessarily in Europe, but he'll appoint some. But from other places. And when his last appointment was a cardinal from Tonga, uh, from Myanmar, from uh, Bangui. I mean, that's the periphery in, in his term. So I think we're going to continue to see that, that kind of change. Yes, hi, Mr. Ambassador. I, I, I again want to thank you for coming here again tonight. <clears throat> I have just two questions. My first is, what do you consider your greatest accomplishment at the Holy See? And secondly, what is something you wish you could have seen more to fruition in your time there? Those are two great questions that, you know, you always get in a job interview. Uh, <laughs> uh, for me, the greatest accomplishment uh, really was getting Pope Francis to the United States because it was, uh, it was not a slam dunk. He had never been to the United States before. His English was imperfect. Um, we had, had seen him make some flubs with verbiage on various things, such as position of women, things like that. Um, so we were worried that he, if he did come to the United States, he was gonna come and uh, it was going to make a mistake, and that was going to flavor the rest of the visit, and it would really be a, um, a disaster. It wasn't a disaster. In fact, it was a, a tremendous success. What would I like to have happened? Um, we tried very hard to get various offices, uh, curial offices, dicasteries, in the Vatican to actually talk to each other. They don't. They really don't. Uh, when you talk in, in management terms about silos in an office or an organization, that is the ultimate. And, and just to give you an example, I think I mentioned it with the, with the CRS crowd this, uh, this afternoon. Um, when I first got there, we were the embassy had long been engaged in the, the issue of trafficking of people. And so we convened at my residence within the first month all of the people we could find among the Vatican offices and the religious communities to come over for lunch 
all the people who were dealing with trafficking, most of them had never said a word to the other, and they were both dealing exactly with the same issue. And that changed the environment a little bit, so that four years later, there were many more meetings on human trafficking, and many more of these people all related to each other, and that was a, a positive, and I would hope we could have done it on other issues as well. Ambassador Hackett, um, over here. Yes. Um, I saw a little news item in the past week or two about after an audience with Pope Francis, um, Saudi Arabia legalized driving for women, and I don't know if there's any correlation. The, the media wanted to suggest a correlation between a meeting with Pope Francis and the head of the Saudi state and that legalization of driving. That aside, um, how do you see this pope's relationship with Islamic leaders? Um, to the first point, the pope would never get involved in an issue like that. It just wouldn't happen. Neither would his staff. They just wouldn't. The new Saudi leader, um, Ben B B I N or something like that. I forget his initials they use. Uh, he's he's changing things very rapidly, and it's causing a real pushback among some of the old hardliners and the Islamic courts and things like that. Um, Pope Francis, when I when I talked about 360 dialogue, uh, I referenced it in terms of world leaders, but it's the same in terms of religious leaders. He is always meeting with different religious leaders. Uh, Islamic, the, uh, the grand imam of uh, Al-Aqsa in Egypt has been uh, at least twice. He's had Iranian delegations in. He's had um, Omani, uh, Iraqi delegations. Um, he does have an issue, and that is that Saudi Arabia and some of the emirates open up uh, churches for uh, Christians and treatment of Christians who are there. So it's not not all love and peace, but he's, he's willing to dialogue about it and he's aggressive in reaching out to dialogue. But he's doing the same thing with Jewish groups. With uh, He went up to Sweden to, uh, on the 700th anniversary of Martin Luther. I don't know why he went to Sweden. Martin Luther didn't hit the wall in Sweden, but anyway, he went to Sweden. But he's always doing that. He's always reaching out. Uh, and back to the Israel-Palestine thing, he invited Abbas and Perez um, to come, and this was spur of the moment, to come to Rome and have a, not a peace celebration, but a, a prayer kind of for peace. And they planted a tree together. And, um, and there was a lot of symbolism in it. Um, drove his staff nuts because he did it on the spur of a moment. Uh, but anyway, so he's always reaching out. Thank you. This is extremely interesting. This sort of to see this in a kitchen, if you will, uh, of the Vatican. Uh, the question has to do also with the ecumenical relations uh, of the Vatican, and specifically touching on Cuba and the meeting in early 2016 between the Russian Patriarch uh, and and the Vatican. What was uh, the reaction of um, um, the sort of the, the perhaps perhaps of, of of your office and and in general of the American government to this uh, because of how fast this was arranged and also more importantly what was post meeting with the Russian Orthodox Patriarch Kirill uh, what was the assessment of what has just happened and 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 implications of that so it has been obvious to many that the Pope would like, as previous popes have done, to create a closer relationship uh, within orthodoxy um, and then between orthodoxy and the Catholic Church. The meeting with uh, Patriarch Krill did happen very quickly and not everybody who should have known that it was going to happen knew in time. It was hatched by Cardinal Koch uh, who's in charge of that relationship, and somehow the Secretary of State didn't know until about two days before uh, it was going to happen. It, it was a real flub. Um, the, the translator, 
who I know very well uh, from the Vatican, said it was just a crazy show. Um, the Pope was trying to create a sense of religious dialogue. Patriarch Krill was talking about geopolitical dialogue, and they were just going right past each other. Having said that, that didn't stop the Pope. Cardinal Parolin, the Secretary of State, went up to Moscow about three weeks ago and met with um, Patriarch Krill, uh, Putin, and again, it's an attempt to where, where can we agree? Now, Krill is very threatened because um, he sees in Ukraine he's losing a portion of his, his flock. You have Patriarch Bartholomew down in Constantinople, and he's, he's up with the Pope at least once a month on some issue uh, of climate or something like that. And there's Krill trying to protect his, his territory. So I don't know whether we're going to make any, uh, there will be any progress made. Around Patriarch Krill, there are some individuals who are definitely against improving relationship with the church. I would say Patri um, Archbishop Hilarion is one of them. He's a former foreign minister, and there are many others. So I think it's, it's kind of like the China thing. It's little steps, um, and you create a sense of goodwill and trust, and then you take another step forward. It doesn't happen with a big deal that's going to happen overnight. That's my take on it. How the, the U.S., um, I can tell you that when uh, the American ambassador in Moscow learned about it, <laughs> he kind of came flying down on the, on the, what they call the high side, which is the confidential uh, computer channel, saying, what's going on? What, what are you, what, did you know about this? And, you know, like blaming me and everything. But uh, it, it, we got over it quickly. Uh, and uh, everybody kind of, after a few days, saw it for what it was. Krill needed the photo op. The Pope wanted better relations, but it just didn't happen. Um, I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about the process of what it was like to be appointed, appointed as an ambassador and maybe a little bit more generally about how the U.S. goes about choosing uh, representatives to an entity like the Holy See. Um, I can tell you about my case, how this administration goes about choosing representatives to the Holy See. I really don't know. I'm ignorant uh, about it. So what happened um, is that I retired on uh, February of 2012, had a big retirement party, had everybody there from the office, standing room only. Um, and as I was giving my final speech, I saw two guys come in in the back of the room, uh, and I'm, I'm squinting because the glasses aren't working great, and I see, oh, I know him. He's the chief of staff in the White House, and that's his brother, uh, who's a priest. <laughs> Anybody from uh, Minneapolis, St. Paul here? <laughs> so. Uh, afterwards, we're having uh, a glass of wine and things like that, and Dennis uh, says to me, Ken, can I talk to you? And so he pulls me aside, and he said, uh, would you consider being the ambassador to the Vatican? So I didn't even have to ask my wife. I said, yeah, that that would be great. Uh, and so uh, that was uh, February 2012 under Benedict. And I thought that would be something nice to do in retirement. What the heck, uh, fun. Uh, and then it went dead. We didn't hear anything. So we did the retirement thing. We went to the Grand Canyon. We visited friends in Arizona. We came out to, uh, for a commencement in San Francisco and went to Notre Dame to get the Latari Award and da da la da la da Back to Baltimore in retirement, and I had to go in for a heart operation in January of 2013. I come out of the hospital. And you don't move very well after a heart operation. You kind of get up, and they send the nurse over to help you. And you're, you're really you're incapacitated. And three days out of, after the hospital, my wife takes a call, and she says, it's from the White House. 
and it was Dennis again. He said, can you remember that conversation we had? Would you still like to go? <laughs> so I got better quick. <laughs> so it was simple. Um, the White House was looking for somebody who had worked with the U.S. bishops, who had their trust, who understood international issues, and could defend most of the poli foreign policies of the administration. Not that many people. Uh, there were a lot of people who gave a lot of money. I didn't give any money. So if you give money, sometimes you get the job. I didn't have any money to give, so uh, so that's that's how it all all went. So you go searching for somebody who the bishops in the United States trust, who has run something of fair size, who understands foreign policy, and can work with the administration's policies. Simple. What was the other question? Did you have a second? Oh, well, that, that's how. But you, there, are, there are basically two types of ambassadors. There are career ambassadors, so you come up through the State Department, and eventually you hope that you may, are made ambassador. And then there are political ambassadors, and that is broken down to two types, well, three types. There are bundlers. You know what a bundler is? Bundler is somebody who gets all their friends to put their money together and then makes a contribution. And then they're just plain rich people who want to buy their way in, and sometimes they get in. And then there are fewer people, kind of like myself, who have special skills that they want to they want to tap in. So that's how it works. So you mentioned early on Francis's strategic vision and the desire to clean up finances and cler uh, address clericalism and so forth. What's your take on how effective the Council of Cardinals is going to be in his efforts to uh, reframe the Curia, renew the Curia? Well, he is already uh, reframing and renewing. First of all, the new Dicastery for Integral Human Development combines three different uh, pontifical councils. So that's a more efficient operation. Secondly, he brought together the various media functions, Radio Vatican, Radio TV, Vat uh, press office, there are about five of them, and he put them under one head. Um, he's done uh, the same with laity. He brought things together under laity. So he, he's streamlining things. It's, it's pretty hard because he tells the heads of these offices, well, I want this streamlined, and we're going to combine these offices, but you can't lay anybody off. Uh, it, it, it's tough on them. Uh, so he, he's about that structural stuff, um, certainly. That, that is going on right now. On the finance side of things, he's made some headway, but not a lot. There's still a lot more to be made. He's, he's got the Vatican um, Bank under control. Um, as I, as I said, uh, we signed an agreement on tax law, anti-money laundering law. It's got those kind of things are being being taken care of. There are still other portions of Vatican finances that really need specific attention. The Vatican owns a lot of property. Um, the Vatican hasn't raised some of the rent on that property in 50 years, because um, Uncle Luigi had the property before, and he gave it to his nephew, who gave it to his son. Uh, there's a lot of that that goes on there, and and it's just not transparent, and he would like to clean that up. Um, lastly, there's a, there's a big question about how powerful the Secretary of State is, and whether he's powerful enough. But Francis did set up, uh, at the advice of his Council of Nine, the Secretary of the Economy. But more recently, the head of the Secretary of Economy has had to go back to Australia. Um, so that has given more room for the Secretary of State to creep in and take more power on economic issues. So there are things happening. Uh, many people believe that he should have moved faster. He should have moved more profoundly. But nothing in the Vatican moves fast. It just, that's an oxymoron. Uh, 
Good. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, thank you much, very much, Ambassador Hackett. Just a reminder, uh, there is some uh, refreshment. There are some refreshments in the lobby. Please do hang around, and um, I think there'll be an opportunity to speak face-to-face uh, -face with Ambassador Hackett. I wanted to really thank Ambassador Hackett for uh, accepting our invitation to be here. Uh, this is a very, very special occasion. Uh, President Sullivan mentioned the honorary degree that uh, we here at St. Thomas gave to Ambassador Hackett, 2011, was it? Yes. Um, we are in the presence here of an individual, right, who has dedicated his life and has continued to dedicate his life to the church, to public service, to the common good, right? Uh, you don't meet this kind of person every day, believe me. And if I, if I may say so, you, you are really a model for the kind of student we seek to educate here at St. Thomas, right? So um, please join me in giving a very warm round of applause to Ambassador Hackett. Thank you. Thank you very much. And once again, thanks everyone for coming out um, uh, and please enjoy some refreshments in the lobby.